Don't forget to press record button. I just pressed it. Thank you. Because sometimes I forget, Amira, but not today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let's wait a minute that, uh, that people join us. <clears throat> uh, people are joining fast. See, you're very popular, Amira. <laughs> I think uh, quantum machine learning is popular, not not so much me, but yeah, yeah we can we can pretend it's me. <laughs> Combination, yeah. Ah, so I need to stop the sharing. Sometimes I forget how these things work. And um, and okay, let's um, let's let's start then. Yeah. So good afternoon. Everyone, welcome to the mini school. <clears throat> uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I have the pleasure to introduce again, uh, again, 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 <laughs> the, the, the speaker of today, and that is uh, Amira Abbas. And as you know, Amira is a is a is a very famous PhD student in in uh, in my group, yeah, which is famous because of her. And uh, and today she's giving us the the third lecture in her um, course on uh, on quantum machine learning yeah and if i remember correctly today she will speak about um, training of variational models or something like that <laughs> yeah so amira uh, thank you very much again for the for the for offering the course ah and before i ask you to start sharing the, 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 the your, your slides uh, i wanted to thank all the participants and there were 61 of them who answered the, our first ever quiz. And you should have received uh, the, 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 the answer from Google, how well you did in the, in, in the quiz. And next week, after the, the, the fourth lecture of Amira, we will do another quiz on, the, on today's lecture and, uh, and next week's lecture. So pay attention today so that, uh, so that you can do very well in, uh, in the last quiz of the course next week. Yeah, and I will share now uh, when uh, Amira starts the, the the link to the to the quiz of last week. So in case you you missed to do it, you you still have a chance to to fill out the quiz of last week. So Amira, thank you very much. And you are most than welcome to to share uh, your screen and start with your um, with your third presentation with your third lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. Cool. Okay. I hope this time it works because last time <laughs> we had some technical glitches. Do you see the full screen now? Yes, I'm here. It's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so yes, thank you so much again, Francesco, for such a nice introduction. Um, welcome back, everybody, if you're, if you're joining again. Um, thank you for returning. I hope that this talk will be probably the most in, informative than, um, than all the lectures I've given so far. And the reason I think this, or I hope this will be the case, is because now we finally get to talk about different quantum machine learning models. So in this lecture, I want to just give you an idea of a few, a few types of quantum machine learning models at a very high level. So we won't go too much into technical details on all of them. Um, I want to make you aware of them, and then we focus particularly on one type of model, and then we'll code it up as well. So yeah, please feel free to ask questions at any time. And I just want to remind you what we previously covered, right? So in the first lecture, we talked about variational circuits and how do they work. There are these circuits that depend on, on parameters, which you optimize. And then we spoke last lecture on data encoding strategies, so how to actually encode classical information into quantum circuits or quantum states so that you can, you can use it. And now today, what we'll talk about is actually combining these two things together to create quantum machine learning models. So after we've encoded data into a quantum state, how can we optimize parameters in a circuit in this variational architecture to do interesting things in machine learning? And what I also want to, want to kind of just outline is there are three interesting topics, I think, that are all three topics that are worth mentioning. And the one is this idea of kernel functions, which come up quite a lot in classical machine learning. So I want to talk about how quantum computers and quantum computation can offer um, some sort of advantage or interesting things there in kernel functions. 
Then I want to talk about neural networks because they are extremely popular and probably the, the topic I get asked about the most and, and really want to just show you how to think about them in a quantum setting. And then the, one, the model that I've said that we'll talk a little bit more deeply about is the variational classifier, which I like quite a lot. And then lastly, we'll go over a, a coding example using Qiskit um, and we will code up a variational quantum classifier from scratch, which I think is also quite cool. Okay, so I want to put up this picture again. I, I had this up in, in, I think, the first talk, and I just want to remind you again of the, of the framework or the template that I speak about when I, when I refer to quantum machine learning. It's very much this kind of architecture where you have some sort of um, input state, some, some beginning, um, beginning state that you start with, uh, in a quantum circuit. And then the first goal is to try and encode your information into the quantum circuit, right, by some data embedding or feature map schemes. Then the next step is to have some parameters in your model, and you can introduce parameters into your circuit or your model through a variational circuit, right, through variational techniques. So you have some operations in this block that depend on some parameters. And then you have to measure your system, your quantum system, and somehow interpret this measurement as a label, an output, or a prediction for a machine learning task. And so the first thing that we talk about, that I want to talk about, is this, this idea of support vector machines, right? So many of you who are from classical machine learning backgrounds will be very familiar with this type of algorithm. And a support vector machine is basically a classification algorithm. It tries to classify data. And how it works is it specifically borrows from a few, a few techniques, which I think quantum computers can offer a, an interesting advantage in. So the first is something that we, we already spoke about. It's this idea of, of feature maps. And what a feature map, I just remind you, what a feature map intuitively says is like, you typically have some, some data that's given to you. And this data exists in a, in a low dimensional space, right? So maybe in this picture here, you've got two dimensional data where every data point can be represented as a vector with two entries. And you want to be able to classify this data with a very simple classifier, right? So if we take the simplest case of a linear model, then we'd want to, to separate the two classes of data, the yellow and the purple, with a linear model, with a line going through this, this data. But you can see there's no way we can draw a line through this data such that the two classes are linearly separable. But by applying a feature map function, we can map this data to a higher dimensional space where we can use a very easy classifier to separate the data. Because now when we map the, the data from a 2D space to a 3D space, we can see now that we can draw very easily a linear um, a hyperplane in this case, a plane that separates the two classes. So this is the intuition behind why we would do this, why we would take data and map it to a high dimensional space, because it should be easier to classify in this space. And so now a kernel function is um, particularly cool because what it does is it says, okay, let's take in, so I just write very loosely here, this kernel function as some function kappa, and it takes in a data point X and another data point X prime, we'll call it, and it spits out some measure of similarity. So if we go back to this picture, essentially a kernel takes two data points in, in the space and measures how similar they are to each other. Okay, and what's even more uh, convenient and nice about these kernel functions is that they apply to the feature map space of your data. So you can apply a feature map function to your data and transform it from one space to another, to a high dimensional space. And then you can apply kernel functions to also measure the similarity between these feature mapped data points, between these data points in high dimensional spaces. So this is something called the kernel trick. Okay, and what do these kernels actually look like, right? So typically, in a very simple form, you can think of them as inner products between different vectors. And these inner products give you an idea of how similar two vectors are to each other, two data points are to each other. And so now when we go back to the idea of quantum feature maps, right? So remember I told you that taking classical data and encoding it into a, a quantum state, like you can think of then this quantum state as this very high dimensional vector, this corresponds to a feature map into quantum Hilbert space. So if we have a kernel then that operates um, using, trying to find the similarity between feature map data in, in quantum states, 
then we can call this a quantum kernel and we can write it also like this inner product where instead of just you know the usual classical notation with a comma we just have these pipes to represent this direct notation which is really convenient because if we go back to this um to this picture here if we have this picture and we want to try and and um, use quantum, a quantum model to compute a kernel function, then all we have to do is arrange our circuit such that the output that we measure corresponds to a kernel that, that gives rise to an inner product of two, two states that we want, to, we want to understand how similar they are to each other. And it turns out that this is a very natural thing for a quantum computer to do. So to design these kind of circuits that give us these kernel, these kernel calculations um, are very natural, very, um, are very nice to get out of, a, out, of, out of a quantum model, which is quite, quite cool. So, um, and then also something that I want to just highlight again at a very high level is that we also in the setting where we have this machine learning model that spits out a kernel instead of a prediction, right? Um, we don't have to think about these two blocks as being separate. So here you've got data being encoded, being embedded in a quantum state, and then some parameters in the model. But when you're encoding your data, you can also like teach your model how to learn to embed data into quantum Hilbert space. So you can essentially train the feature map in a model so that you can optimize the kernel output that you measure from the circuit, which is a really, really nice idea that was introduced in um, a paper that I think was published at the beginning of this year, which I'll put on the next slide. So basically they, they discuss about how the the feature map, the embedding of classical information into a quantum circuit can actually be trained and optimized um, by just simply plugging in the kernel into a cl classical cost function. This can, be, um, this can be in a bigger algorithm, like in a support vector machine, so you have like a hybrid algorithm, but basically the, the data embedding into a quantum state can be trained and optimized. And this picture is really nice. It comes from the paper that I, sp that I spoke about by um, Seth Lloyd and, and, um, and a few others. Uh, it's called Quantum Embedding for Machine Learning. These slides will be available. Um, and yeah, I think it's really nice. So they, they talk about how they can take some data and embed it into Hilbert space optimally such that um, they, can, they can classify the data very nicely. So if you're interested in these like quantum enhanced kernels and, and trying to understand how you can get a quantum enhanced support vector machine and other algorithms that make use of these, of these kernel functions, um, I encourage you to read the following papers in the following order, actually. So the, this first paper talks about um, implementing a very nice and simple distance-based classifier. So they, they encode information into, quantum, um, into a quantum Hilbert space, and then they measure the distance between data points in this space and talk about how actually kernel functions arise from certain measurements that you do in the simple circuit. And then in this paper here, quantum machine learning in feature Hilbert spaces, it's also really nice because what they do is they look at it from the other way around. They say, okay, if we have um, a data embedding strategy, what kernel does the circuit give rise to? So they look at like um, at uh, amplitude encoding and a few other encoding techniques, which we discussed last week. And then they look at the kernels that can arise from these circuits. So this is also quite nice. Um, this paper here is a, a beautiful paper, Supervised Learning with Quantum Enhanced Feature Spaces, where they talk about um, a quantum support vector machine, where the kernel that they create um, using a specific type of circuit is conjectured to be classically difficult to calculate. So this paper really argues for a quantum advantage, if you, if you will, um, where they say that their, their kernel is, um, is quite hard to simulate with a classical computer, especially when the data becomes, uh, becomes high dimensional. So this is quite interesting. And we'll also talk a little bit more about this paper as well. And then the last paper that I want to mention here under this uh, kernel stuff is this quantum classifier with a tailored quantum kernel. So this was also a really nice paper that extends very much what, what, we, what happens here in this distance-based classifier. And they show that with some neat tricks and measurements, you can actually extend this idea of, of getting um, uh, kernel calculations out of a quantum circuit. And you can also get like higher powers and orders of these kernel sets. So it's, yeah, so it's really quite, quite nice. And I think this is quite a nice literature review in this area. Um, Okay, so that was that. And, oh, and I, one thing I want to also say is um, if you're from a classical machine learning background, you might immediately say, but um, calculating the inner product um, is not hard, right? It's, it's easy, even if you're in an infinite dimensional space. Um, and the reason why I think these, these, um, these kernel calculations coming from quantum circuits are 
nice and beneficial is because very often you want to build up a very large kernel matrix. And even though like the entries of these kernel matrices might be easy to calculate, might be, not always, the bottleneck is really building up this, this matrix of every single point with each other, trying to calculate the inner products of every vector with every other vector. And so I think this can be sped up quite a lot with, with, um, with the quantum circuit being designed to instantaneously spit out a, a, um, a, kernel, a kernel output, a kernel calculation. Okay, so that is kernels very quickly in a nutshell. Then I want to talk about neural networks. Um, okay, and so the reason, I actually always try to avoid talking about quantum neural networks because um, everybody is always very excited about, about the idea of neural networks, right? Because they work so well in, in the classical setting and practice, these models are very powerful. They can learn almost every pattern known to mankind. Um, and, and then the next thing to naturally wonder is like, obviously, um, quantum computers can, uh, quantum neural networks can offer some advantage or some boost or some, something good here in this neural network architecture, right? And I think um, it's rather disappointing what quantum neural networks actually, actually can offer and allow me to motivate a little bit why we shouldn't really, in my opinion, we should, this is not really where the gold is in quantum machine learning. So I remind you um, very quickly about what a, a neural network is, right? So I just want to watch time. Okay, perfect. So a neural network is um, quite simply, you can think of it as, and now I've, I've put up this picture that everybody probably hates seeing, right? It's this classical picture that everybody uses to explain a neural network. But um, nevertheless, I think it's good for, for an explanation. So you can think of it as taking inputs, right? So some data, and um, we can think of this data for now just as a, as a vector, right? And you, your neural network takes these inputs, these input vectors, and multiplies them by a weight matrix. So I call this, this first weight matrix theta one, for example, right? And then after the weight matrix is, a, is um, multiplied by your vectors, your inputs, then these, um, these values are kind of thresholded or, um, or squashed or squeezed by some nonlinear function. So there is some uh, nonlinearity that is applied here to get these values of these neurons. Okay, and so these nonlinear functions are called activation functions. And then you can apply this several times, right? You as, a, as an engineer can decide how many hidden layers you want, how many weight matrices you have. You can play around with the size of the neurons, which influences the size of your weight matrices. And really, you can, you can design these big and beautiful, wonderful, um, over-parameterized neural networks that, that classify data really well. And then eventually, you need to kind of converge to, um, to an output, right? So, so in this very simple setting, we've just got um, our inputs, our data. Uh, we've got one, one weight matrix here that gives us the values at one hidden layer. And then we have um, another weight matrix that gives us our values at our output layer. So if we were to write this mathematical function down, it's, it's very simple to do, right? We can go ahead and, and write it. And we can say that our prediction extracted from this neural network model is simply our data x multiplied by our first weight, weight matrix. Then we squash it like by applying this nonlinear activation function, I just call it sigma. Then we times this by, again, the second, um, the second weight matrix, theta two. And then we apply some nonlinearities to eventually get, um, get an output value. And I'm ignoring biases for now, just for simplicity, right? And so this is just a, just a neural network. It's simply like a bunch of, of linear functions. Um, and then in between are these nonlinearities. And so if we're to ignore these, these nonlinearities in the network, then what we get is a simple linear neural network, right? So a linear neural network is just like our data multiplied by a weight matrix, followed by another multiplication of another weight matrix. And so now if we go into the quantum setting and we try to think about quantum neural networks, and especially in our circuit picture, right? So in our circuit picture, we've got um, some, some starting state, let's say it's initialized in zero states, and then we, the first step is to encode our data. That's cool, that's so far we're in, in line. And now we want to try and apply weight matrices, right? So we can do that. We can simply apply some, some operations, right, to the, to the input state, which encodes our data. And these operations are parameterized, so we can think of this as like our, our theta one weight matrix, if you will. Um, 
And then we can do this as many times as we want, right? We can apply another block with um, different, with uh, more parameterizations and call this our second weight matrix. But to inject nonlinearities in between these things, like, um, a like a classical neural network does, is something that's really unnatural and very hard to do in a quantum computer because these operations are unitary, right? So they have to be linear in some sense. And so if you want to create nonlinearity in your model in a quantum setting, then the source of nonlinearity really has to come from your measurement operator. And so there are tricks and things that, you, that one can do to, to, to create these nonlinearities through measurements. But really what I want to highlight or what I want to show to you is that to try and get these like activation functions between these weight matrices is something that's really unnatural and really hard to do in a, in a quantum neural network. So I think that um, we shouldn't try and, 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 and adapt quantum circuits to this structure, but really we should try and, and see what, what interesting models can we get from the, from, the circuit from the circuits that we can build and can have. So not look at it going from classical to quantum, but rather just what does quantum give us? Um, and then if you're interested in, in quantum neural networks still, I mean, rightly so, right? I mean, there's still very beautiful proposals for quantum neural network models that I encourage you to read about. Um, but they still, have, they still have some issues. So for example, this paper here, Training Deep uh, Quantum Neural Networks, was published this year and then not so long ago, not so long after, uh, another paper, I should have actually put it up, came, came in and, and criticized this, this proposal for this deep quantum neural networks very, uh, very harshly, I might say, because in this paper, they write it very beautifully and they really sell deep quantum neural networks to be um, better to train, higher accuracy, um, all, these, all these wonderful properties. But then another group came and showed that actually these, these quantum neural networks um, fall into the trap of barren plateaus, these vanishing gradient problems, which we'll talk about in the last talk. So I think one has to be very careful when thinking about um, quantum neural networks and making bold statements because there's still um, a lot to understand about the issues around them. But some other very cool proposals of, of models include like, um, the variational quantum autoencoder. So you can go read about, about this proposal, how to do this on a quantum computer. They use a variational circuit here as well. Um, the QGAN paper is very nice. And um, this quantum convolutional neural networks paper, I actually haven't read it, but I put it in here because it's referenced in, in quite a few papers to be, to be an interesting architecture. So if anybody reads it, please, uh, please let me know what you think and send me a little summary. Um, Okay, so before we go into the variational classifier, are there any questions, Ilya? Uh, not, not particularly those which I cannot answer for you. So you can okay, just brilliant. skip. Because they're, they're mainly okay. like on the links on to the things and so not, okay, nothing. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Nothing too major. Okay, perfect, cool. Yeah. So, um, okay, good. So now we can talk about the quantum variational classifier. And really, I think you will see that this model is, is the most intuitive. It is, um, it is simple. And uh, I think it's really nice as a, um, as a starting point to study quantum machine learning models and trying to understand um, what can we do here in this space. So the quantum variational classifier, um, kind of a spoiler with the name, but we can think about it as, um, and why I like it also is because it, it borrows from very nice things, right? So it borrows from all the nice techniques that we spoke about in the first two weeks. So you can think about it intuitively as like, we encode some data through some feature map, right? So we encode our data using some scheme and um, the data is now in some feature map space in quantum Hilbert space. And the variational classifier simply trains a model using a variational circuit and and classifies the data. So it encodes your data and then it trains some model. So in this picture, it's just like a hyperplane, but it can be a little bit more sophisticated than this. It's a model that depends on some parameters and these parameters are optimized so that this, this, um, this classifier is optimized to classify data in an optimal way. So it's really, if, you, if we go back to this picture here, a quantum variational classifier is 100% this picture. Um, it can be summarized completely from start to end in this, in this one slide where we have um, a feature map and we can choose now which feature map we have, right? So we've spoken about several techniques. Then we have um, a variational 
a variational circuit, so some operations in here that depend on some parameters. And then we do some measurements to our system. And from these measurements, we apply some classical post-processing function, which I'll talk about a little bit later, so that you can get a label or an output. And that's a, a variational classifier. And this label and this output basically tells you what your data should be classified as. So we spoke about different um, data embedding techniques. So I want to go on about that. And while we did speak about in the first lecture how these variational circuits work, right? So we spoke about um, how do they look kind of um, in a very simple model and how do we optimize them. We never really spoke too much about how they look for a, a variational classifier, right? We, I never really said to you how, what, are the common, what are the common variational forms, we call them variational forms, that go into quantum machine learning models. So that's what I want to show to you now and then we'll talk about measurements afterwards. So a very common strategy after one encodes their data via some data embedding scheme is to have a variational form, so a variational model, that, uh, that acts on every qubit with some rotation that is parameterized. So the first step is usually apply some single qubit gates to every qubit in your model. And what this means is you're rotating all the qubits in your model by some angle and you don't know what this angle is, right? This angle is parameterized. This is what the model has to go and figure out and train and optimize for. Um, so this is like the first, the conventional canonical first step. The next step is then to apply some entanglement between these qubits. And again, you also have a lot of freedom in the entanglement that you, that you choose to apply. So I've got here in this picture, just pairwise entanglement, right? But one can, can have entanglement between every possible qubit. Um, and there are, other, there are other ways like alternating entanglement structures and, and such. So um, there are different ways in which one can do this, but basically there's, um, there's some entanglement that generally happens. And after this entanglement, the convention is again to, imply, to apply some single qubit rotations that are parameterized. And if you want to increase the number of parameters in your model, then usually what is done is this block here, the entanglement and the second set of, of single qubit rotations is repeated. So if you want to increase the number of parameters in your quantum model, you simply just like repeat this block over and over with different parameters, right? So you're adding more parameters in your model that your model needs to train and optimize for. And, and theoretically, I mean, like in theory, if you, if you start to increase the depth of your variational circuit, so you start to have more parameters in your model, you're over parameterizing your model, then, um, then the complexity should increase, right? So it should be able to express more complicated relationships. Um, okay, and so, and just want to highlight that like from this paper that we spoke about earlier with the supervised learning quantum enhanced feature spaces, they propose a, a variational form very similar to this, but instead they also add a layer of RZ rotations that are parameterized, and then they repeat this block as well in the variational classifier. And so if you're thinking, wow, this seems really arbitrary, right? I mean, we can apply any kind of rotations here. We can do so many different things with the entanglement structure. Um, and why R, Y, Y, R, Z? You're totally right in, in thinking this. Um, and the reason why, so what I present to you today is really what is like most commonly used. And there are reasons for, for why these, set, these architectures are used. And if you're interested in the, in the finer details, I really encourage you to read a very nice paper by Hannah Sim. Uh, she also goes by Sukin. And what Hannah did in, in this paper was try to answer exactly this question, like what type of variational circuits are interesting? Um, and by interesting, she tried to understand how expressive are these variational circuits? So how powerful are they? What, what, how good are they at expressing lots of different functions? And so what you're seeing here is, is this is a picture from the paper where she went from um, you know, very trivial operations that one can apply on, on one qubit up to a very general arbitrary unitary that one can apply. And you can see like, as you start sampling from, from these models, then you start sampling from a more uniform distribution over the entire um, Hilbert space. So this is a very, very cool paper. And she studied exactly all these different types of, of circuits that are proposed in literature that are used in a lot of quantum machine learning models. So I think here circuit 10 is, um, 
pretty much the one that, that I just showed you right now with these RYs and then some entanglement and then another, another set of RYs. And, um, and so here she discusses the, the kind of pros and cons of all these different variational architectures where some of them are more expressive, but some are better for certain hardware constraints. And so, and so really this is, um, this is quite a deep uh, thing to understand, but, but there are reasons for, for choosing these types of variational forms, which is, which is what I think is important. And while there are still reasons, it's still an active area of research, right? So people are still trying to understand why. But for the purpose of today's variational classifier, I want to go with, with this choice of, um, of a variational form. And uh, the reason also is because it's hardware. It's, it's supposed to be hardware efficient and it's also very commonly used. Yes. Sorry, Amira. Can we, before yeah, sure. we continue, can we address a couple of questions? Because yeah, sure. most of them are related to the variation of things, but a couple of them are starting a little bit earlier. So the question number one is how can we make a custom feature map? Okay, cool. I, um, how can we make a custom feature map? So very good idea. I mean, very good question. And the answer is <laughs> you can be as creative and imaginative as you want. So as long as when you encode your data, um, as long as the rotations or the operations that you apply in some way depend on your original classical data, that can be deemed as a feature map, right? So really you have, um, you have so much leeway into thinking about these things. If you go back and watch the, the last lecture, I think maybe this will be a little bit more clear to you to remind yourself, but basically um, you have to apply some operations in this block here. And these operations need to loosely depend on your, on your data, on, your, on the features of your data, so the entries of your data vector. And then, yeah, so this is a, this is a feature map into a, quantum, into a quantum state, and one has a lot of freedom on how to design these. And I can also show you in the code how to play around and change the feature map and create your own after this. Okay, okay, great. Uh, neural networks are structurally similar or same as quantum circuits. Can you please explain the inherent similarity or difference? Yes, I, I agree with the statement a lot, but with the exception of the, of the non-linearities, right? So um, if we go back quickly, uh, let's just go back to this picture here. If we had to just repeat this block with different parameters every time, then yes, you have this sequential multiplication of vectors and matrices, right? Which is exactly what a neural network does but there is no nonlinearities in a quantum circuit. There are no um, activation functions. And so you can think of a, of a quantum model or a quantum circuit as a very big linear neural network. And while this is very cool, this is not so, this is not so amazing because a neural network classically really gets its power from these nonlinearities, from these activation functions. So while linear models are still interesting, they're not as powerful as the models with nonlinearities because these nonlinear neural networks have something called a universal function approximator theorem, right? They, they can approximate in, in theory any kind of, of complicated functions, while linear neural networks cannot, they don't have this property. And so that's really the main difference. And that's why I, I try to highlight that we shouldn't really try to think about quantum neural networks in, in this way, because they're, they're not, they're not the same. As classical. Hello. <laughs> I think okay. I've got a I couple don't. of internet yeah. problems. Sorry, let me just. Uh, no, no go problem. Uh, okay, so the next question is. Yeah, because I, I was just being kicked out. Okay, now I'm back. Okay, <laughs> are there any hints that QNNs share the same universality as CNNs? And uh, can they approximate any nonlinear functions in this sense? Yeah, so I would, I would recommend reading a, a very nice paper that came out recently. Um, and it, it talks about the, the kind of um, functions that a, a quantum circuit can give rise to or approximate based on the data embedding structure. And um, I can't remember the title of the paper, but it's written by, by Maria Schultz. And I think if you just Google like quantum data embedding Schultz, or you can go to the last lecture because I, I referenced it in the, in the last talk. Um, and in this paper, they, they actually show that, um, that quantum models can serve as a, a universal function approximator in the data in some instances. And the class of functions that these circuits give rise to are really interesting and, and very, um, very nice. 
So um, in a very general sense, I don't think there is a proof that, that uh, QNNs can have the same, uh, the same function approximator as the theorem as in classical neural networks and convolutional neural networks. But I still think um, it's a work in progress and maybe, maybe they will, maybe we will get to mm -hmm. one, I'm not sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so in, and what is the purpose of entanglement in a quantum variational classifier? Yeah, good question. Um, the purpose of entanglement is really to just um, to try and create things that are not um, not easy to do classically, right? So um, these are these are inherent quantum properties, and um, we want to see a difference in our circuit, right? We want to make it classically hard to simulate, and we want to see what how can these um, how can these entanglements add as a resource, a quantum resource, to making this entire model classically difficult and perhaps exploring a different, a different space. So yeah, it's to add to the hardness, I would say, of the model. Okay, uh, so is there a chance that adding more depth to our quantum variational uh, classifier would lead to overfitting of our model? That's a very, very um, beautiful question. And I think it's still, um, it's, it's still unanswered because we, we can't get to this, um, this over-parameterized space, right? Because what we can test for and right now empirically is just very, very poor because our hardware is, is, is quite limited. But I, uh, in my own research, I think that yes, definitely we will experience overfitting um, by adding more parameters into this, into this quantum model. Um, because already we're, we're starting to see that these quantum circuits, even at low depths, can express very complicated um, functions. So the complexity is very high. And if complexity is high, this is um, not necessarily very good for capacity control in classical machine learning, right? Where you're trying to find um, the optimal balance between overfitting and underfitting. And so I think that this is something that still needs to be properly understood. And I think that it is definitely a trap that quantum models will fall into. Okay, and can I ask you a couple of more generic questions and afterwards we could, could keep going, okay. So sure. the first question is, as a set Lloyd says, machine learning is a lot of linear algebra and quantum computing is a lot of linear algebra. Do you think that Julia is going to be better than Python for quantum machine learning? Yeah, I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I actually, I must confess, I haven't used Julia. So maybe this is something I... I must check out, especially if someone is kind of recommending it in a way, right? That's, that's cool. Um, and I very much li like and agree the, with the first statement. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I, I think, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think now with the update over the Python with so-called uh, so JAX architecture, which is allow automatic differentiation, there is a strong movement away from Julia because Julia is not supporting automatic differentiation. But that's just, again, yeah. I'm also not an expert, but that's what I understood. Okay, and the second generic question about your internship hosts, IBM says that they're going to have around 1,200 qubits by 2023. Do you think we'll have a useful applications for quantum machine learning algorithms with that computer? Yeah, I mean, so we, we already have useful applications, right? Um, with even the smaller, smaller models, the smaller uh, machines that we have right now are still doing some interesting things in, in simulations and um, especially in quantum chemistry, which I must admittedly say that I know nothing about. But I think there are definitely applications, near-term applications that are useful even now. So yes, totally. And if we have these bigger devices that, you know, I mean, I want to also just highlight that the number of qubits in, in a device is not the most important thing, right? It's like how, um, how stable are these qubits? So there, there's like, you know, you can think of like them as having these quantumness, like <laughs> this coherence and, and how long can they stay quantum for? This is also really important. So even if you have a model with lots and lots of qubits, if they can't stay very quantum for a very long time, then they're still not very useful. So yeah, I mean, this is also something we must think about. So yes, I think there are lots of interesting applications that we can have uh, provided these, these models are good and these um, devices are good. Stable. Okay, and the last uh, question which I'm going to ask because there is a, quite a few, but I don't think we should answer all of them. We should just keep going. Okay. So the, on, your, on your slide, U is a unit operator, of course. What are the typical unit operators taken in such circuits and what are they? Yeah, so I, I um, purposely haven't written the 
matrix um, notation down, right? Because I assumed that everybody is, is already familiar with what these, what these operations look like. So I encourage you to go and read um, a, a textbook that I, I referenced in the very first talk. It's called uh, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chuang. And in there, you, will, you can get a greater understanding of what these unitary operations look like. So I think that's probably the best way to, to do it. Yeah, but the, in this circuit, okay. I mean, you, yeah. you, your effects is just encoding of the data, yes? And the, mm -hmm. the way how you encode the input data, people should go to the previous lecture and it will be, it's explained there, what is the typical U of X's R? Okay, oh yeah, so the, okay, so I see the question was to ask what's in this box here. Yeah, and I purposely didn't uh, readdress this because yes, it was done in the last lecture, thanks. Thanks, Ilya. Okay, let's continue. Okay, okay, okay. cool. <laughs> no, sure, thank you. Um, all right, okay, so, now we spoke about uh, these two blocks and I'm just a little bit worried that we won't have time to go to the code, but let's try, um, we can always do that next week, so no problem. So, um, so now let's talk about this block here in the variational classifier, right? So we've, we've spoken about in the last lecture, the data encoding, we spoke a little bit about the variational forms one can get today. And now what, what I want to conclude with is really this, this um, extracting uh, your label or your output from your quantum classifier. Okay, so the again, I want to present the most common way to do this, right? And um, how people are doing this in practice. But again, you will notice that you have a lot of freedom and choice in, in how to do this. Um, and while it may seem arbitrary, there are justifications. And again, I will try to explain why. So the most common way to, to get an, an output from your quantum model is to simply do some, um, some measurements, right? So some single qubit measurements. And you can measure, remember we first spoke about measurements in like the sigma Z basis, for example. So um, the idea of doing these simple measurements in, in a certain basis comes from the fact, uh, comes from a very nice and intuitive um, fact about measurements. And you can think of it this way. So if we had a very complicated measurement operator, you can decompose a very complicated measurement operator into a complicated quantum circuit with a simple measurement operator. So all these like really difficult measurement operators that one could in theory have here can be decomposed into a complicated circuit with a simple measurement operator. And so by having a variational block here, you can essentially think of this structure as like, you know, learning um, some parameters of your model, but also learning a complicated measurement process so that we don't have to worry too much about um, injecting a very complicated measurement operator here. We can do simple measurements and the variational circuit will like take care of learning. Um, if, if a complicated measurement structure is needed, it would be taken care of in this variational circuit architecture, which I think is quite cool. So that's the intuition as to why these, um, these simple measurements are, are done in practice. And in a lot of quantum models that you read about in the literature, very often they don't even measure all the qubits, um, they just measure one. So there are different um, techniques and different ways to do this, but I would just talk about like simple um, measurements in, in the basis of all qubits. And so when you do this, when you measure, what you get is what you can get is an output bit string, right? So you can measure every qubit and you'll get every time an output of zeros and ones, right? Associated with each qubit. And then if you repeat the circuit over and over again, then you can start to get an expectation value. You start to get a, a distribution of, um, of your outcome. So you have possible basis states associated with the circuit. And then if you repeat the circuit over and over and over again, you can start to understand the distribution over the possible basis states, okay? Um, and so once you have these, these, um, these, these basis states that you can extract from, from measurements from your circuit, you can apply what is called a, a classical, um, classical post-processing function to these strings, to these outcomes. And so I'll talk about what these, these classical um, post-processing functions can be. But basically you can think of it as a way to map the distribution of, um, of your outcomes over your, your possible basis states 
and maps it to a distribution over your labels, right? Over your label classes. So in machine learning, you always have, um, in a supervised setting, you always have labels for your data, right? So in a, in a binary setting, you can have two classes where, is it a cat or is it a dog? Is it class one or class negative one? And so um, some, some probabilistic models kind of spit out probabilities over different classes, right? So what I'm trying to say or highlight here is in a variational, a quantum variational classifier, you can get a probability distribution over possible basis states through lots of measurements, and you can convert this probability distribution to a probability distribution over your possible labels. And I'll show you how. Um, and yeah, so this classical post-processing function is the thing that actually does this and maps this probability distribution to um, a probability distribution over possible classes, which in this case, we'll just consider binary classification where, where there are two classes, plus one and minus one. Um, okay. Okay, so cool. So I, I, I think it's very um, nice to think about things in, in a very simple, simple way, right? So if we just consider um, a basic model, let's say we have uh, five qubits in this model, then there are two to the five possible basis states you can get, right? So I'm not going to, I hope I did the math right this time. I remember I got that wrong. Um, so I'm not going to write out every possible basis state, but um, you know, you, you can just uh, visualize them in your mind. You get like all these possible bit strings, right? From your circuit. And each of these possible basis states can be associated with, um, with an expectation value. So you, you kind of get, uh, a, a probability distribution over every possible basis state by doing lots of measurements of your model, right? Lots of, um, yeah, lots of measurements of your model. And then now we can calculate probabilities over labels by applying some rule, by applying some classical post-processing function. So what do I mean here? I'm going to take an example, again, from the supervised learning um, paper. So if it doesn't make sense, I encourage you to read it, read this paper afterwards. Maybe it will make sense then. And what they do in this paper is they compute the parity of these basis states, right? And then based on the parity result of every basis state, they sum the expectation value and they associate these sums with different labels. So for example, if we assume now that our classical post-processing function F is the parity function, they compute the parity of every basis state. So the parity of the all zeros is zero. And the parity, for example, of this bit string here, this basis state here is one. And this basis state, every basis state is associated with some expectation value. So let's just assume that these two basis states are associated with these expectation values, right? 0 0.2 and 0 0.1, I'm just making this up. But let's say you've repeated samples and you've, you've, you, you know these expectation values, or these probabilities, I should say. And so what they say in this paper is they say, okay, for every basis state with even parity, we'll sum that, we'll sum that probability, and that will be the probability over our first class, over class one. And then the basis states that correspond to odd parity will take those probabilities and group those together, and that corresponds to class two, which is class negative one in this case, the second class. So in, it's a very trivial way to, to kind of understand how to map the probability distribution over the possible basis states to different classes. They're just computing the parity of every basis state. And then if the parity is even, they're taking that probability associated with that basis state and summing it to, to get the probability of a certain class. Um, and you can again immediately see that this seems completely arbitrary, right? I mean, one can, can come up with a rule that just says, let's just take the probability associated with this state here. And that can be the probability of being in class one. Um, and the probability associated with the state here can be the probability associated with class minus one. And then we ignore everything else. And this is totally valid. This is a, a, another way to do a classical post-processing function. And, um, but you need to have justifications and reasons to do these things. So um, this is one proposed way that's meant to work quite efficiently. And, um, it's, it's interesting that there's still, you know, we don't really understand because we have so many different ways in which we can post-process and do these things. So really, again, the door is open to explore what different methods we use, but this is, this is one, one method that's used in the variational classifier. And it's the method that I will use in the code after this. 
Okay, so yeah, so I want to put up this picture now again, just the full one, right? So the quantum variational classifier can be summarized in the slide where we've talked about this data encoding here last lecture, and um, we can we also coded this up using Qiskit. So we're going to make use of these feature maps again in the code. And then now we've spoken a little bit about the variational circuit where this can be repeated if we wanted to increase the number of parameters in the model. And now finally, we spoke about like extracting from measurements labels so that we can then plug these, these expected labels from our, from our model, these predicted labels from our model into a classical cost function and check how did we actually do with, it, with a particular model and then optimize the parameters in this thing. Okay, and then once we've extracted the labels, a very quick comment is that now we can make use of any classical cost function, right? Because we've got labels from our model and we've got labels that um, are true labels from the actual data. In a supervised setting, we can check this using mean square error, cross entropy loss function. We can do a lot of, um, a lot of nice things. So the cost function that we'll be using today is a, a sigmoid cost function, which kind of looks like this curve here, where if you intuitively try to understand it, the probability of, um, let's say our model assigns a probability of zero to the correct class label. And that's really bad, right? Because it's saying that there's no chance that the correct label is the label. So the cost is really high, it's at its max. But as the probability of assigning the correct class label increases, so now if we go here, the probability is one of assigning the correct label. So the cost goes down to zero. So this cost function really nicely captures the relationship that we want to see. If our model is very, is very confident about the right value, it's got a very low cost, associated to this. If our model is, um, is very confident about the wrong value, it's got a very high, um, very high cost, which is, which is quite bad. Okay, so now I want to quickly go, let's see, how much time do we have? We have nine, eight minutes. Um, maybe it's worthwhile doing the code in the next lecture and we'll just take a few questions now. I'm not sure what do you yeah, guys if you, if you want to go yeah. uh, five, ten minutes uh, above uh, the, the, the three hour deadline, <laughs> you're welcome yeah, as, you, as you wish. And okay. So um, everybody will, will be very happy to, to, do, to, to, to comply. Yeah. Okay, cool. I also will not be offended if anybody needs to leave. I'm very cognizant of, um, of time, but let me stop sharing and I go now to the code. And if people want to come back later and watch, that's also perfectly fine. Um, okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay, do you see the Jupyter Notebook? Uh, yes, Mira, thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Um, so now in this notebook, um, and also I, I kind of predicted that I might not have time to, to code live this time, unfortunately. So I'm, most of the stuff is already pre-populated. And this will, of course, be available to you to go and play around with. Um, and in this thing, we build exactly the, the variational quantum classifier that I put up in the last slide. And there are a few things um, that you can go in and tweak and change yourself. So the data that I'm using is, uh, so everything is, is built here with Qiskit. Um, and in the next lecture, we'll use Penny Lane again. But for today, we'll do Qiskit. And what I, the data set that I use is, is one that's imported directly from the standard data sets from Qiskit. And um, we'll then need a quantum circuit object. And then we can also, from Qiskit, import different quantum um, machine learning optimizers, right? So the optimizer I'm using today is, is something called Covila. I think it's a, it's a gradient-free optimizer, so it doesn't actually use gradients to optimize the circuit. Um, but we can use others here. There's also Adam, and I think there's also stochastic gradient descent, and, and all these others that we're familiar with from classical machine learning. And then what I want to also emphasize is that from the circuit library, I'm importing two things here. I'm importing the feature map function that I'm going to use, and then the variational form that I'm going to use. And the variational form with these, um, these RY gates and some entanglement in RY gates is called the real amplitude circuit. Okay, and then everything else is pretty standard. Um, this state vector function here is, um, it will be clear a little bit later. 
Okay, so we can go ahead and since we're importing a, an ad hoc data set from, from Qiskit, we can specify what we want the training size to be and what we want the test size to be. I'm just gonna say 120. And I'm gonna choose a small dimension. So number of qubits in the model, I'm just gonna choose two just to make it um, run a bit faster. And what we do here is we kind of, um, using this ad hoc data set from Qiskit, we create some training data, some test data, and um, some class labels associated with this data. So I'm gonna print also the class labels and show you, oh, I didn't run the first one. I'm going to show you that um, we're just looking at a case with binary, binary labels. So there should just be two classes associated with this data. Okay, so in this case, there are two classes, class A and class B. Now we need to set up our circuits for our model. So the state vector object here from Qiskit is quite nice. It's um, something that it creates a circuit that you can initialize in any state. So what we do here is we initialize um, the zero state and we multiply it in time. So there's n qubits in our, in our model and they're all in the zero state. So that's what the state vector object is, is doing. And then our feature map, we want to use the ZZ feature map, which if you remember from last lecture is this higher order feature map. And we can specify the number of qubits in the feature map. So we'll have that as N. And how many times do we want to repeat this feature map? I'm just going to say one for now. And now we have to specify the variational form. So we can do that using the real amplitudes function. We also have to say how many qubits we want in this and how many times we do, do we want to repeat it. So I'm just gonna say one for now, but you can increase this. You can also go and check out all the other different circuits you can use as feature maps, as variational forms that are pre-built into Qiskit, which is really quite nice. And then our circuit needs to combine these two things, right? It needs to have our feature map, then our variational form. So we want to attach to our feature map, we want to combine to our feature map, the variational form. And then if we, if we print the circuit, let me just uh, actually do circuit.draw. I think this is a little bit nicer. Then we can see that we've got the first part is our feature map. So the feature map does Hadamard's and codes our, our first feature second feature and then our product of features. And then we've got our variational form and we just have two qubits, right? So we've got an RY and RY, some entanglement, and then another RY and an RY. So we have four trainable parameters, theta zero, all the way to theta three. So this is our, our model and a, a very simple version of it. And then we have to create a few functions that are, are necessary for this variational classifier. So um, I won't go through them in detail right now, but if you have any questions, I mean, go through the notebook and then we can discuss them in, in the next lecture. Um, but basically what, what these functions do, so this, this one right here, it's, let me just run it quickly. What it says is let's associate the parameters in the feature map with our data and let's associate the parameters in the variational circuit with parameters that we pass to this function. So it's just, it's just associating in a nice dictionary the, um, the data with the feature map circuit and the parameters with the variational circuit. Okay, and then we can, um, we can test this by assigning the, the parameters and passing through this dictionary function. So if we do that, we can see very nicely that that, for example, for uh, this data point and these parameters, the model actually is using the correct, um, the correct stuff that we pass through it, right? So in our last lecture, we did it very untidily where we, we passed all the data in a, in a for loop. But here we, we create a nice function that, that does this in a, in a more elegant way, I think. Okay, and then the next two functions that we need are like this assign label function and return probabilities function. And this is exactly what I spoke about where I said um, we have this parity post-processing function. So what this assign label function does is it takes in a bit string and then it returns the class label based on the parity of this bit string. And the return probabilities function then returns a probability distribution over our possible classes. So this is exactly what we, what we want for our model output. And then we can test it, right? So 
here I'm, I've just done a, a random example where, for example, I just say that the bit string that we have is zero, zero. And uh, we do, let's say we do 20, um, 20 samples from our quantum circuit and the zero, zero comes up 10 times. And this string, bit string here, zero, one comes up 10 times as well. And the others don't come up. So this should be 50-50 chance that um, based on these results that each of these two bit strings occur, right? And if we check that out, then that's what we get, right? So remember, zero, zero has even parity, right? But zero, one has odd parity. So even parity is associated with class A and odd parity is associated with class B. And if we had to change this, let's say, let's say we add in, because we have other possible basis states, right? So, um, oh, what did I do? Let's say we have um, one, one, and associated with that, we have like 20 observations of, of this string here. So now if we compute the labels, we can see that the label for class A increases in probability because one, one has even parity as well, right? So even parity and even parity, these outcomes are summed together and their probability distribution is, um, the probability of this even parity is higher. So this is just one classical post-processing way to do this. And these are the, the functions that I've written up that I think do it quite nicely. Um, okay, then we need to write a function that classifies our data. Okay, so we'll need all those previous functions that we mentioned. And what we do here is we write a, a small function to classify and it takes in our data and some parameters and the class labels. So what's happening here is it's, we're creating an iteration over every possible data point. So we're going for X in our list of data. Then we're assigning to a circuit our parameters that we pass in and each data point. And we're evolving our quantum states. If you remember the state vector here is initialized in the zero state, we're evolving it by our parameters and our data. And then we're creating a list of all these circuit objects. We're creating a circuit objects with parameters and each data point. So we're essentially creating a big list of, of quantum circuits that have every data point encoded with parameters. And then what we do in the second loop here is we calculate then the probability distributions associated for every, um, every data point. So we essentially extract predictions for each data point and we store them in this, this props argument here. And then we can test this and see if it works. So I'm just gonna pass in um, this data point here, arbitrary, and I'm gonna say that the parameters are some NumPy array and see if it works. And it does, it, it gives us a prediction that this data point here is, um, belongs to class A with 85% probability and class B with 14% uh, probability roughly. And if we change this, then we'll get a different, different probability. And we do. Okay, again, I um, want to be cognizant of time, so I apologize if I'm going very quickly through this. Um, I wrote up again a little, actually, I didn't write this. This was already given to me. Um, but a very nice way to represent the cost function is the sigmoid cost function, which I drew a little bit earlier. I plotted again for you for your reference. And we can use this, this, um, this sigmoid cost function to calculate the average cost over all the data points in our, in our model. So what this big cost function here is saying is it's saying for all our data points, let's classify them using our model and some parameters that is passed in. And then based on these model outputs, let's compare them to the actual training labels. So the actual labels from our data. And then we compute the cost. So the, the how wrong was it or how right was it? And we average it over the, the length of our data. So how many data samples we use. And so that's basically what our cost function is doing. And so we can test that our cost function makes sense, right? So we can pass in some random parameters, which I initialized earlier, and, um, and a training input and the class labels and compute the cost. And we get this cost value here of uh, 0 0.47, which is not very good, right? I mean, if we look at our cost picture, it can go down to zero and our cost will lie between one and one and zero. So now we can train finally this classifier because we have all the ingredients that we need. And um, 
and what we need to specify is an optimizer. So if you remember from our first lecture, we also we use the atom optimizer, so you can use different ones here. And you can set the maximum number of iterations that you want to, to optimize for. And what I do here with the objective function is I actually take the cost function and I use this nice lambda function here from, from NumPy, uh, sorry, from Python. And the lambda function just basically says, if you want to keep something in a function variable, then you say what you want to keep variable and then you pass it another function. So I want to keep the parameters variable, right? Because we're going to train these, we're going to optimize these. And so the objective function is really this, this lambda function, which is this cost function, but the parameters are not fixed. There's something that can vary and we can train. Then we initialize the parameters randomly. And then we can use Qiskit's optimizer to optimize this whole, um, all the parameters in the model in the cost function. So this is really quite, quite elegantly done, I think. I mean, not by myself again. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I haven't, um, I've pre-executed it, so I wanted to just show you, because uh, in the interest of time, that we start with an initial cost value associated with these parameters that are random, randomly initialized. And then as the model starts to train itself, you can see the cost function eventually starts to go down, starts to go down and starts to convert. So after 100 training iterations using this Kobila optimizer, we get a final cost value of uh, 0.23, which is not very good, but um, we can do better definitely by playing around with different optimizers, maybe adding more parameters to the model. But this is just a simple, simple example. And then using these optimal parameters in the model, we can now test the classifier's performance on testing data, on, on the test data that we, that we generated in the beginning. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I want to show you is that we can then go and see where did our data go wrong and where did it go right? And we can actually even plot very nicely all the mistakes that we made. So given that we've only trained this, this, um, this model on 100 training iterations, we achieve 65.5% uh, accuracy on, on the test data set. So we got all these, these ones circled in red wrong. So this is not very good, but this model can definitely achieve a much higher test accuracy if we just go around and play with things like um, the optimizer, the learning rates, the, the number of iterations, and all these other things that we can do. The feature map, we can also change. So I encourage you to go and uh, check this out, check this notebook out, and um, mess around with it and see what you can, you can find that's interesting. And I think I will stop there for now. Okay, thank you very much, Amira, for another fascinating sure. lecture and uh, a lot of encouragement to, to play around with, with, with your code. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Sure. Ilya, I imagine there are still lots of questions. Yeah, there are a couple of questions which I think uh, uh, need to be uh, answered. So, Amira, what is your view on QRAM for quantum machine learning and the QRAM in the sense of Maria's studies? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, QRAM is a very theoretical kind of assumption, right? And I think, Ilya, you're probably more qualified to answer this than me. So I think it's, um, I think models that rely on this is a, it's a very futuristic demand. Um, and I, I personally am more fascinated with these variational models because there are things that we can do right now with, with data that we have right now. So, um, yeah, I don't have an opinion. I think that there are something, something for the future when we when we have these these uh, kind of things available like QRAM. Okay, and and what would you do in case of the example which you have shown us with the uh, with the variational classifier if it would be overfitting? Yeah, uh, such a such a good question. Um, I'm not I'm not sure because. I mean, there are very various techniques, right? I mean, the most most obvious one, I guess, would be to just reduce the number of parameters in your model if you if you reach a stage of overfitting. But then it's you know you run into questions like which parameters they do you then take out and why? And um, I think this 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 problem of overfitting really really needs to be better studied in in quantum machine learning, and it's something that I really want to look into as well. And um, I think we don't have an answer yet. And and we also can't even really go into these overparameterized regimes as yet. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure, unfortunately. <laughs> so it's probably going to be my answer to a lot of questions. It's like, I don't know. Um, we, we are trying to find out. 
Okay, so I think that's all. Uh, I think Ilya, there is one last question uh, that, that you might have. Can we study regression problems with variational circuits? Yes, why not? Um, I mean, the outputs that you you get from variational circuits are um, they don't have to be thresholded, right? So they can just be interpreted as a as a regression output. So yes, definitely. I mean, you can interpret these models like that as well. Yes, I think. <laughs> yes, if that's course. the question. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for staying late. The chat, Ilya. I don't know if you've seen it. Sorry? There's also a question in the chat that just came in. I don't know if you've seen it. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Maybe we can use that as a last question. Yeah. I'm wondering, what is quantum here in the algorithms? Which step show the quantum advantage? Um, yeah, so, so do you, I think if they mean in the code, no step there really um, shows a quantum advantage, right? But there are hints that, that um, these feature maps, for example, these higher order feature maps, when you go to higher dimensional data and more qubits, they become very, very difficult to simulate on a, on a classical computer. And so the, um, the advantage is that these feature maps work well and they, um, they're also classically hard to simulate. And also these variational circuits that, um, that, that I showed you are also classically hard to simulate when in these, in, these bigger, in these bigger spaces. So the quantum advantage could come from scaling these models up and then training them. But unfortunately, this is really hard to do without the hardware. So we're still, um, we're, we're still in conjectured phases um, where we're, con we're kind of um, stipulating or su suggesting that these are these are advantageous algorithms but yeah there are, there's no hard proof that this quantum variational classifier is is better okay then um, Amira then thank you very much this might be the right point to to stop for 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 today and um, we will uh, resume on Tuesday next next week and next week there will be again uh, uh, a quiz so you have a week to to learn very hard and to play with uh, with the code of amira and uh, just as a, a little advert on monday afternoon at four nitep will host a very nice talk by by matthias troyer on the or on the quantum future of computation so if you are interested uh, you will find all the necessary information on the on the nitep website in order to to register for the talk Amira, then thank you very much again for the for the for the another brilliant lecture, where we all learned uh, a lot, and we are all very keen to hear how the story will end next week. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ilya, for moderating the question, and thank you to all the participants for for following 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 us regularly. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.